afternoon, everyone. Oh, and you guys. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started with our afternoon session. And um, we're very fortunate to have this next panel discussion on behavioral health and substance abuse. We have three panelists up here. I'm gonna actually introduce them um, individually as they come up to get, give their talk, but we have Dr. Brad Fitzwater, Dr. Lucy Perrier, and Dr. John Isaac. So first, uh, Dr. Brad Fitzwater is going to talk about maternal substance use. Dr. Fitzwater is the Maternal and Child Health Medical Director at the Texas Department of State Health Services. Prior to joining DSHS, he also served as the Medical Director for the Substance Use Disorder Unit at the Texas Health and Human Services Commission. So interestingly, in reading his bio and talking with him, I found we had something in common. He also earned his Bachelor of Science degree in Chemical Engineer. He actually worked in operations management for eight years prior to going to medical school. We discovered we both worked for Procter and Gamble. <laughs> and, um, and then after that eight years, he went to medical school, earned his medical degree at Mayo Clinic and is board certified in Mayo Clinic, I'm sorry, and is board certified in both addiction medicine and ob -GYN. And he is gonna talk to us now about um, maternal substance use. Good afternoon. Um, today I'm going to give a brief overview of Texas maternal overdose data and efforts to decrease maternal deaths due to opioid overdose. I'm going to first talk about findings from a study of overdose maternal deaths where opioids were found to be involved in the majority of cases, and I'll also discuss Texas AIM and our implementation of maternal safety bundles developed by the Alliance for Innovation in Maternal Health, or AIM with a focus on our plans to implement the newly developed AIM bundle on obstetric care for women with opioid use disorder. So we know that accurate and actionable data is critical for the success of efforts to prevent maternal mortality and morbidity. The Maternal and Child Health Epidemiology Unit within our Division of Community Health Improvement conducts scientific research and data analysis that supports and complements the work of the Texas Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Task Force. The work done by this unit also informs and drives programming aimed at reducing maternal mortality and morbidity. Fundamental to understanding and analyzing the data is to agree on a set of definitions or common language to use when describing maternal deaths. And defining maternal deaths turns out to be somewhat complicated as there are conflicting definitions between the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization defines maternal death as the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy, irrespective of the duration and the site of pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management but not from accidental or incidental causes. Interestingly, the CDC's time frame is 365 days rather than 42 days. And additionally, CDC uses different terminology, including pregnancy-related and pregnancy-associated, to categorize maternal deaths. The WHO definition is the one that is actually used to calculate the maternal mortality ratio, or MMR, while the CDC definition is the one used to identify cases for task force review and is the definition used in this study that I'm going to describe. So in this study, our epidemiologists examined maternal deaths that occurred within 365 days following the end of pregnancy for the years 2012 through 2015. Maternal deaths were identified by matching each woman's death certificate with a birth or fetal death within 365 days. This method was used because it is known that identification of maternal deaths using death certificates alone is often inaccurate. Data for 2012 was further refined through review of medical records and autopsy reports for evidence of pregnancy, including miscarriage. However, this further labor-intensive step was not undertaken for years 2013 onwards uh, due to lack of resources. The results of the initial analysis are shown here. This is the number of maternal deaths by timing and cause of death during the four-year time period from 2012 through 2015. In total, there were 382 maternal deaths 
within 365 days following the end of pregnancy, overdose was found to be the leading cause of maternal death with 64 overdoses, overdose deaths occurring between 2012 and 2015, and 49, or almost 80% of these overdose, overdose maternal deaths occurred more than 60 days postpartum. I also wanted to mention, uh, although I won't discuss it further here, that there were 33 deaths during this time period due to suicide and five deaths due to substance use sequelae, um, such as cirrhosis. So to more clearly identify where the greatest opportunities exist for public health programs to institute prevention efforts, our Maternal and Child Health Epidemiology Unit looked more closely into overdose maternal deaths during this time period. The specific substances involved in these overdose maternal deaths were investigated, along with demographic characteristics of the women who died. Overdose maternal deaths were also examined by timing of death and geographic region to further target prevention efforts. You'll recall that in total, from 2012 to 2015, there were 382 maternal deaths identified within 365 days from the end of pregnancy, and that of these, 64 were due to overdoses. Identification of substances involved required a detailed search of death certificate narratives since death certificate coding lacks sufficient specificity. Based on this search and the death certificate narratives, the in-depth analysis of these 64 overdose maternal deaths showed that 42, or 66 percent, involved a combination of substances rather than a single substance. 37, or 58 percent, the majority, involved opioids either alone or in combination with other substances, with 35 percent of these opioid overdose deaths also involving benzodiazepines. Overall, 49 or 76 percent of the deaths occurred more than 60 days postpartum. The specific substances identified from the death certificate narratives are listed here. Since 42 of the 64 overdose maternal deaths involved a combination of substances, the counts within and across the categories in the table uh, it won't sum up. Uh, it is important to note that the types of opioids captured under this analysis include some that could have been prescribed and that it also includes methadone and buprenorphine, both of which are used in medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder. The takeaway here is that opioids, including heroin, accounted for two of the top three specific drugs identified in overdose maternal deaths. The study also examined characteristics of women who died of overdose and compared them to those who died from all causes. The risk profile for overdose maternal deaths parallels that for all maternal deaths, with the exception of race, ethnicity, and region of the state. Findings from this study suggest that white women are at greater risk for overdose maternal death, while black women are at greatest risk for maternal death overall. The risk was highest among those aged 40 and over. The risk for maternal death due to overdose was higher among women residing in urban rather than rural counties, with those living in public health regions two, three, including Dallas-Fort Worth and public health region one and the Panhandle more at risk. Lastly, the risk for overdose maternal death was also highest among those who were enrolled in Medicaid at delivery, which is assumed to be an indicator of low socioeconomic status. And this slide shows the overdose maternal death rate for each public health region in Texas. And as previously noted, the rate of risk for overdose maternal death was higher among women who reside in public health regions 2, 3, the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and in public health region 1, the Panhandle. <laughs> Senate Bill 17 of the 85th Texas Legislature directed the Department of State Health Services in collaboration with the Maternal Mortality and Morbidity Task Force to implement a maternal health and safety initiative. To meet this requirement, the department has partnered with the Alliance for Innovation on Maternal Health, or AIM, to implement maternal safety bundles in collaboration with hospitals and providers statewide. Now, most of you are already aware of these DSHS efforts to decrease maternal mortality and morbidity through the Texas AIM program. Implementation, implementation of AIM Maternal Safety Bundles is a critical activity of our agency and our division. 
AIM safety bundles have been shown to be effective in reducing severe maternal morbidity using evidence-based systems to enhance maternal care. These bundles are a collection of resources aimed at achieving a specific goal, and these resources may include items such as checklists, best practices, and example protocols. The resources are bundled together so that they can be used by a medical team to improve outcomes, and each bundle is designed not only to emphasize evidence-based interventions and strategies, but also to be flexible enough to be implemented differently in different contexts. Now, findings from the study of overdose maternal deaths clearly shows the need for preventing and treating maternal substance use, particularly opioid use. Implementation of the AIM bundle, obstetric care for women with opioid use disorder, is a crucial next step in addressing these problems. The specific goals of this bundle are to improve identification and care of women with opioid use disorder through screening and linkage to care, optimize medical care of pregnant women with opioid use disorder, increase access to medication-assisted <coughs> treatment for pregnant and postpartum women with opioid use disorder, prevent opioid use disorder by reducing the number of opioids prescribed for deliveries, and optimize the care of opioid-exposed newborns by improving maternal engagement. The bundle is also unique within the AIM program as the intent is to impact and improve not only hospital care, but also care that takes place in clinics, providing prenatal and postpartum services. Unlike other AIM bundles that were initiated many years ago and have now been implemented in several states, the opioid bundle is new. Texas partnered with other states and AIM at the national level to develop and finalize the bundle for release. The work was carried out by four national work groups, including those for provider education, clinical pathways and quality improvement, metrics or measures, and community outreach and engagement. The bundle has now been released and is in various stages of implementation in four states, including Texas, New York, Tennessee, and Illinois. With ongoing collaboration among these states to work through the challenges unique to this bundle, DSHS is working with 10 hospital systems throughout the state to pilot the bundle. As these pilot sites gain experience with the bundle, DSHS plans and uh, prepares for statewide implementation beginning in the winter of 2020. The hospitals, clinics, providers, and communities involved in the pilot will then serve as experts for the statewide implementation. So this is a map of the 10 hospitals or hospital systems that have volunteered to pilot the opioid AIM bundle. Uh, and the, the list can be found on the DSHS website. Um, I just wanted to throw up here as well the bundle materials from the AIM website. I know you can't read it. I don't expect you to read through all of it here. You can look at the website, but it's pretty comprehensive. Um, there are sections in here for most aspects of of the quality improvement project. And then there is a, a very extensive list of resources, links, uh, and uh, other items that have been developed by the team that put the bundle together. So go to the AIM website, look this one up. Uh, you can get a lot more detail there. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fitzwater. Next, we're going to have Dr. Perrier, who's going to speak to us on behavioral health and caring for prenatal women with maternal health and anxiety. Dr. Lucy Perrier has been a national leader in the field of reproductive psychiatry since the beginning of her career, when the number of experts in the United States were few. As a resident, she began treating pregnant women with psychiatric illness in a high-risk OB-GYN clinic in the county hospital in Houston. When she joined the faculty after residency, she began a women's mental health program in the Department of Psychiatry which at the time was the only such service in Texas. In order to devote more time to developing expertise in hormonally related psychiatric illness, she left academic medicine and spent 10 years in private practice. She was then recruited by Texas Children's Hospital to start a women's mental health program and their newly opened women's hospital, the Pavilion for Women. 
She is an associate professor in the department of OB-GYN and has grown her division to include four psychiatrists, one psychologist, and two social work therapists. They have instituted standardized screening for postpartum depression in all the hospital-affiliated OB practices and received a grant to begin a screening and referral program for all 51 Texas Children's Pediatrics practices. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Perrier. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Um, that should say, I'm going to talk about the program that we developed in Houston. Um, should also say pediatrics because we actually have a system-wide screening and referral program in uh, all the OB-GYN clinics and pediatrics practices affiliated with Texas Children's Hospitals. Um, I am very spoiled. I have a very large institution behind me that has supported us financially. So this is a um, first world situation, but I'm gonna talk about ways that I hope this model that we've developed can be applied nationwide. And that's actually been a goal of mine long term, to develop a standard of care for recognizing peripartum mental health issues that cannot just happen in Houston or New York City or LA, um, but all across the country. ACOG recommends that women are screened. One of my pet peeves is that uh, screening is recommended a lot, but there's no point in screening women for perinatal depression or anxiety unless you have some place to send them. And most of the country has no place to send these women. So when I first started at Texas Children's about seven years ago, we very carefully rolled out our screening program to make sure that if we encouraged obstetricians and pediatricians and family practice doctors and social workers and whoever to screen for these disorders that we guaranteed we were going to be able to take that referral and take care of these women. So ACOG recommends both screening but not to screen unless there are treatment opportunities available. The United States Preventative Services Task Force also recommends screening of pregnant and postpartum women but again, recommends don't screen unless you have some way of taking care of these women. And the American Academy of Pediatrics is also encouraging pediatricians to screen because pediatricians actually are seeing the women and their children more frequently than their OBGYN postpartum. And, and clearly, the health of the mother is paramount to the health of the baby who is the pediatrician's patient. Now, Pediatricians are reluctant to screen, and it's taken us a long time to get the 51 Texas Children's Pediatrics practices to implement screening. And there's lots of reasons for that, one of them being if you're a pediatrician and you have a mom who identifies as having um, a significant mental health problem, what do you do? Who owns that patient? And again, so it's been very important if we're going to ask pediatricians to screen for women's mental health needs, that those pediatricians feel like they've got a handoff, some place to send these patients. So again, I'm gonna describe what we've started. We have screening, uh, the P Pavilion for Women has three OBGYN practices, and Texas Children's has 51 community pediatrics clinics. We take referrals from all over the state we get people driving in from Louisiana, we, we will see anyone. We take all insurance, we take Medicaid, we take Medicare, but in terms of screening um, and training, we trained three obstetrics practices and all the pediatricians practices. It took us three years to train all the pediatricians. But as of right now, if you deliver a baby at the Pavilion for Women in Houston, you are screened at the first prenatal visit the goal being to do risk assessment and identify women at risk or who are having difficulties prior to delivery. We want to be able to prevent morbidity postpartum. Also screened again between 34 and 36 weeks. Again, trying to pick up women who may have mental health needs prior to delivery. The pediatricians are screening at the first newborn app appointment. The OBs are screening again at six weeks postpartum and again at two, four, and six months postpartum, which are the Bright Futures recommendations for pediatricians. 
Um, a lot of the women are sick of getting screened in our hospital. <laughs> but a lot, of, they're grateful. This, this you don't need to read. I put this up here because one of the things we have found when you're going to institute a program, you need to have a very clear process in place so that people can pick up from the beginning and be able to walk through what happens so that they are confident that if they screen, this is what's gonna happen. And basically, we've got smart sets in the electronic medical records for documentation. We've got the form in EPIC, which is our electronic medical record. Um, we've got electronic referrals back into our clinic, so it's pretty seamless. If a pediatrician or OBGYN does a screening, they can send us an electronic. You wanna make this as easy as possible to get women care. So if you took this and did it in some other system, this process would not look exactly the same. But again, I make the point that when you implement a program for mental health care and you're asking non-mental health professionals to assist in that um, assessment of women, you wanna make sure that they're very comfortable with the handoff and the process. So I, I put some, um, some of our data up. We, have more than 15,000 screens now, but um, the slide's from February of 2017. I think people are afraid of screening. Um, we use the EPDS, the Edinburgh Postpartum Depression Screen. We use a cutoff of 10. 10 does not mean you have postpartum depression, but it's a good indicator of maybe you need to um, have further evaluation. Depending on what research you read, the incidence of postpartum depression is eight, per, eight out of 10 women, oh, sorry, not eight out of 10, two out of 10 women to one out of 10, um, depending on the population, socioeconomic status. We use a cutoff of 10. This is for all the obstetrics and pediatrics practices. The average score was four. So most women are not going to screen positive. Most women are gonna have scores between, you shouldn't have a zero, because if you've ever had a baby, um, four is pretty normal. Um, but you see that about 1,300 women scored greater than 10, and that's about a little below 10%, which is what it expected. So you're not gonna flood the system with lots of positive scores. When we took it out by just the obstetrics practices, again, the average score was about four and about 10% positive. Um, one of the big problems with mental health care is getting women, once you screen, getting them actually to treatment. So you can screen, you can refer, but getting them actually to go to the appointment can be a bit difficult. So we wanted to see, okay, we've got people screening, they're sending in the electronic referrals, or the women actually getting cared for. Now, the obstetrics practices had um, referred to us actually more patients than screened positive. And the reason for that is that we encouraged anyone, if you were concerned about a woman, to just go ahead and refer her to us, whether she screened positive or not. And the OBGYNs took us up on that. They were like, so they referred us lots of patients. Pediatricians, um, we didn't get as many referrals from the pediatricians, and I'll explain some of my thoughts about that, but um, we got a, a, of the referrals we received, we received about 30.8 um, of their positives, 30.8% of their positives. So here's actually what I was trying to get to. Completed appointments, we considered an appointment completed if the woman showed up for one appointment. So many of our patients come two, three, four, five times, but if she came once, we considered that a completed appointment. 77% of the OB referrals actually completed an appointment. Very low number of pediatrics referrals, 22%. 77% of completed appointments is pretty unheard of. If you look in the literature about how many people actually go follow up with a mental health appointment after they're referred, it's in the 30% range. So something we're doing with the OBGYN practices is working pretty well. The pediatrics practices, not so much. This is what I think is going on. So 
We've got coordinated care, co-located care, and integrated care. Coordinated care is the pediatrician. Woman goes to the pediatrician's office, she gets screened, she's told she has a positive screen, she's asked if she wants a referral, she's given a referral, she's got to get to us. We're not in the pediatrician's office, and most of the pediatrician's offices aren't very close to us. We've got locations in the medical center, we've got two locations in North Houston, We've, we're trying to broaden our area, uh, so it's really hard to get into the medical center in Houston, but again, we call that coordinated because we're not in the pediatrician's location. Co-located is where the OB practice is in the same building as the mental health clinic. That's where I work in the Pavilion for Women. We're on the third floor. We've got one OB practice right around the corner from us, two others upstairs. Women's coming to the same building, same parking lot, very familiar. We do pretty well there. The integrated care, we actually have a mental health, a psychiatrist embedded in the ob -GYN clinic out in the community. So that's the same waiting room, the same reception staff, the same offices, the same bathroom, it's the same place. We call that integrated care and you can see that about 82% of those women actually follow through and make their appointments. So there's something about having mental health embedded in primary care or the location where the woman is already being seen. The Centers for Women and Children um, have a model, and it's also Texas Children, Texas Children's, where you can get same day appointments from behavioral health care. And I don't have their numbers, I'm not privy to those numbers, but their follow through rates are pretty good. Because if the patient is identified at the day of the appointment as needing mental health care, they are immediately seen that day. So again, mental health care, Gone are the days of a referral to a psychiatrist and you've got to wait three months and the office is down the street in the basement. Um, that doesn't work, never has. Um, mental health care actually, for it to be successful and destigmatized, actually needs to be part of normal everyday care. We have a very special population. It's mostly middle class, mostly married, mostly non-Hispanic. We do take Medicare and Medicaid. Um, it's harder, when we look at our numbers, it's harder for those women to come. We are actually providers for Texas Healthy Women. So I managed to, it was a fight, but we got on the provider list for Texas Healthy Women. Um, so they can come to us up to a year postpartum as opposed to getting cut off from mental health care at, the two, at two months. Um, but I think you need, unique strategies given your population. We probably need mental health care embedded in the pediatrics clinic. We probably need, we are piloting a home visitation program that maybe women with other issues, maybe they do better if we go to them. So there's lots of ways of addressing these needs that I think we need to be culturally sensitive, we need to be economically sensitive um, about the kind of care we provide and what's best for a particular patient. So some take home points. Screening is a, an important part of perinatal care. Um, women don't stop having mental health needs because they're pregnant. And postpartum psychiatric illness is one of the most common morbidities postpartum. So a lot, as you heard, suicide is one of the leading causes of maternal morbidity. There are treatment for these issues and actually postpartum depression, anxiety, bipolar disorder is not that difficult to treat. You just need to recognize it. Early identification of women at risk decreases morbidity. Our goal is to see women before they really need us because there's some strategies you can put in place to hopefully prevent women getting worse. They can't wait three months to see a provider. We try and get all women in within seven to 10 days. Integrating mental health provider into the clinic increases referral and follow through and enhances patient satisfaction. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist. It can be a master's level therapist, a PhD, a social worker, a mom. We're probably going to try and implement um, a mom to mom peer resources. There's lots of ways of, of, of linking moms to help. It doesn't have to be a high cost psychiatrist. Um, 
you do need to establish some relationship with someone who can prescribe if you're not comfortable. And so you need to be able to have a good relationship with someone that you can give a warm handoff. Just handing someone a card and saying, call this person, isn't going to work. We call every woman that's referred to us. We don't wait for her to call us. There's other ways we are uh, trying to roll this out. Um, telehealth, we've got telehealth facilities in Beaumont now. Um, we're looking into opening up some in San Antonio. Because again, there are very few people with expertise in treating, from a psychiatric perspective, women with mental health care needs. And so if we can do telehealth appointments and be a centralized hub for women in Harris County, in Texas, um, then that's going to get more women care. And there are, there are other models around the country looking at very similar things, consultation lines, where you could be in Waxahachie and call our clinic and consult with a psychiatrist or a PhD or a social worker. Again, getting innovative away, uh, about providing women care. I will say, because my other two colleagues up here speaking about substance abuse, we do a lousy job with substance abuse. Um, if you thought depression and anxiety in women was um, the ugly stepchild, substance abuse is the, I don't even know what's worse than an ugly stepchild, but um, the redheaded ugly stepchild, I don't know. Um, <laughs> We don't have substance abuse services. We don't have any way of caring for these women. And it's, it's criminal. Anyway, that's my political statement for the day. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Perrier. Um, finally, we'll have Dr. John Isaac speak. Dr. John Isaac is the medical director of the NICUs at Northeast Baptist Hospital and Baptist Medical Center in San Antonio, Texas. He received his medical degree from Kasturba Medical College in Mangalore, India, completed his pediatric residency training at the University of Medicine and Dentistry of New Jersey, and completed neonatology fellowships at both Baylor College of Medicine in Houston and Wilford Hall Medical Center in San Antonio. He served in the U.S. Army Medical Corps for eight years, attaining the rank of major. During that time, he served a squadron surgeon in the 3rd Striker Brigade, which was deployed to Baghdad, Iraq in 2006 to 2007. He continues to serve as a lieutenant colonel in the U.S. Army Individual Ready Reserves. Another thing uh, kind of in common, my dad was in the military for over 30 years, so as I welcome Dr. John Isaac, I'd like to thank him for not only caring for our babies, but also his service to our entire country. Thank you, Dr. Davidson. I want to thank the planning committee for having me on this panel. It definitely is a privilege and an honor for me. As Dr. Davidson mentioned, I am um, actually a neonatologist. Yeah, I'm actually a neonatologist. I work at the Baptist Medical Center, which is in downtown San Antonio. San Antonio is in Bear County, and we have the dubious distinction of accounting for about the 30% of the neonatal abstinence syndrome for the whole of Texas. So that 30% is actually more than Dallas and Houston combined. So for whatever reason, Bear County has 30% of neonatal abstinence syndrome for Texas. In my hospital, we have about 1,200 deliveries a year, and it's a level two NICU with about 22 beds. Every year, we admit about 50 to 60 babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Um, just to put that in perspective, in Texas, according to Medicaid data, Medicaid is what pays for about 75 to 80 percent of babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. All of Texas will have about 1,200 babies born every year with neonatal abstinence syndrome, and we take care of about 50 to 60 uh, babies of them. We were also certified as a center of excellence by Vermont Oxford Network. How many of you all actually work in LND or the NICU? Can I just see a show of hands? Wow, so I really don't need to talk here. <laughs> I was given the task of talking about the hospital perspective of mothers with substance use disorder. So all this is new, uh, old news to you guys. All right, so in my hospital, 70% um, of the moms are what we call drop-ins with no prenatal care. And different hospitals, depending on their tie-up with the methadone clinics, have much better capture rate in terms of moms already in the methadone uh, treatment, methadone programs. 
However, our hospital being located in downtown, most of the moms are just drop in. There's several reasons why we know that this patient population doesn't want to come to the medical establishment. First of all, there's a lot of fear, guilt, shame. They already know that there's a baby inside and, and the motherly instinct tells them that they're harming their baby. So a lot of these moms just don't want to come and see a doctor. And on top of that, there's legal ramifications, right? I mean, am I, I'm gonna be worried about CPS coming and taking my other baby, so I don't want to go and see this doctor. So unfortunately, a lot of these moms just are drop-ins, so they haven't got good prenatal care, they haven't got the prenatal vitamins, and many times their baby may have some surgical condition which just happens to be found out as they're delivering. So that's one of the things that keep them from seeking medical help early on. As uh, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald mentioned, there's a lot of poly drug use, and especially in San Antonio, at least, we're seeing more of the heroin and methamphetamine in addition to the opiates. So we're seeing a lot of poly drug use, and those are the babies that is more challenging to treat. Many times you've got to use a secondary medication in those babies. Uh, at least once or twice a month, we have the um, uh, law enforcement people bringing mothers from the jail. A pregnant mother in a jail will be brought to deliver at our hospital, and, and all that goes along with that is one of the challenges we have to face. You all know that it's, it takes a special person to deal with these, this patient population, right? Sometimes they're much more challenging, they don't listen to you, they may use different words, and so it takes, <laughs> it takes a lot of patience and compassion to be an LND and a NICU nurse. I, I know for me, when I go for rounds, I'm there for a short while, and I can walk away, but sometimes for a nurse to be there for 12 hours with a crying baby, I would think that there's a lot of PTSD that she has to face by the time she goes home. Um, Dr. Purior mentioned about the comorbidities, very common to see bipolar disorder, anxiety, depression, and we know that this population that uses, has a substance use disorder, a lot of them have trauma in the past, anywhere from 60 to 90% of them have suffered some form of trauma in the past that you know, many times drives them to seek these substances. We see a lot of uh, inconsistencies. When you go and ask mom what she's used, you know, she might be totally out of it, did nothing, and many times we hear the common story that she happened to be with her boyfriend who was smoking in the car, right? I mean, you all have <laughs> heard that story, right? So many times the stories are inconsistent. You cannot get a proper history from these moms. So many times you gotta rely on the only objective screen, like the maternal urine drug screen, to tell you whether to even expect the baby to withdraw or not and how to manage the baby. A lot of these moms obviously have STDs, and again, I think San Antonio is one of the higher rates of syphilis, and that's going up, and so a lot of these babies get three to four neonatal abstinence as well as syphilis. Uh, hepatitis C is quite common. A lot of them are, you know, they have uh, IV drug use, and so we see a lot of hepatitis C. About 40% of the, the substance-using moms that deliver in my hospital have got hepatitis C. A lot of them, it's very challenging to get an IV in because most of their IVs are thrombosed. And uh, a lot of them have skin infections, cellulitis. So it's a, it, it, it takes a, a lot of support to take care of the, one of these moms. And even they're, high, they're at high risk for all kinds of morbidities and mortality. And so it takes a team in caring and, and a team that is prepared in LND to be able to properly care for these uh, moms with substance use disorders. And lastly, I also want to mention a lot of these, a lot of the obstetricians haven't been trained on how to control pain in these moms. Many times they have much more pain sensitivity and they developed a tolerance to a lot of these opiates. So your little Tylenol dose, a Tylenol 3 dose or you know, morphine dose is not going to touch them. And already you have in your mind that this mom is a drug seeking mom. She's, ah, oh, there she goes again. She's ringing the bell. She wants more medication. All right, she's just, you know, so we roll our eyes, but we don't realize they truly might be in pain. So often we see the moms so much in pain that they take a trip to the cafeteria and they step outside and the boyfriend drops something off and suddenly she's happy. <laughs> so it's obviously not my doctors who've given them the morphine to control the pain, but they will find pain control somewhere else. So knowledge about how to take care of these moms, especially post cesarean, I see a lot of these moms you know, in pain and sometimes we blow it off saying that she's just drug seeking. You know? So that's one of the areas that we are struggling with, more education in terms of the obstetric providers, knowing how to control and what dose of methadone to use because you don't know how much mom has been using. So where do you start, at 50 milligrams, 20 milligrams? So that education is also a need. Coming to the NICU, 
Um, some of the NICUs have even 80 to 90% of their NICU babies have got neonatal absence syndrome. Thankfully, in Texas, we are nothing like the Appalachian region, Kentucky, Tennessee, where a lot of those babies have, you know, they have such high incidence of uh, neonatal abstinence. Thankfully, in Texas, we are not anywhere close to that. But still, with the general increasing trend, we do have babies with neonatal absence syndrome. Uh, one of the things we try to avoid early on is to keep the babies and moms together. If at all possible, if there is a mom who is coherent, or she's got someone, a caretaker, uh, uh, um, someone, uh, someone in the room with her, whom, whom we are sure that will keep the baby safe, we try not to separate the babies and moms. Because once you separate the babies and moms, it's much higher chances the baby's withdrawal will be much worse. Speaking of neonatal absence syndrome, all of you all know it's just a withdrawal syn uh, syndrome that comprises of three main components, the autonomic nervous system, the GI system, and the neurologic system. You see these babies sweating, they have temperature instability, a lot of them have vomiting, diarrhea, feeding difficulties, difficulty gaining weight, and if you work in a NICU, you won't forget that shrill cry, that inconsolable, irritable, shrill cry. It's so difficult for us to take as caretakers in a NICU. So those are the symptoms of neonatal absence syndrome. Um, in my NICU, per se, about 50% of the babies have neonatal absence syndrome, and these babies can be there for a couple of, five to seven days or even couple of weeks or even a couple of months in those extreme cases. First we try, as I said before, we try to avoid separation. Then the mainstay should be non-pharmacological methods. You all are familiar with the five S's, right? Swaddling, swaying the baby back and forth, soothing music, if at all, pacifiers, keeping the stimulation level down, and skin to skin. That's, that's the most important point, having moms there to do skin to skin, or dads to do skin to skin. So if babies go on to withdraw worse, we start medication. And the ones we use in our NICU is morphine. About 10 to 15% of NICUs use methadone. And if things are so bad that you need to use a secondary medication, we go on to phenobarbital or clonidine. Um, again, there's a lot of studies going on, which is better. You know, one article comes out saying you know, phenobarbital, another one comes out saying clonidine, and so methadone, morphine, a lot of stuff. We're still not sure what is the best way and best medication to treat these babies. Uh, a lot of these babies, as I mentioned, have got feeding difficulties, they don't gain weight well, so a lot of the therapists are involved, a lot of them need NG feeding. The caloric requirement, because the metabolic rate is so high, we have to give them sometimes 150 to 200 calories in order to get them to have weight gain. Um, one of the blessings in our NICU is we have 21 cuddlers, or 21 volunteers, there from 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. every day. So we have people from all different varied background, and there was a talk about how to secure uh, grants and funding. One of the things that we, we secure is hands that can hold. So for us, it's, it's a godsend when we see a volunteer walking in, and the nurse just gives the baby over, <laughs> good luck, and she can go on to other stuff. But God bless those cuddlers, because I tell you, they have decreased our length of stay, and they really enhance our ability to wean the medication to get these babies out of there when the parents cannot be there. Um, uh, going on to uh, the length of stay, average length of stay in, for us in Texas is 21 days, and the cost associated in Texas is about $32,000. So if you look at the number of babies out there that I mentioned about 1,200 in Texas, $32,000 average, 21 days, even shaving off a few days will bring a lot of cost savings. Um, 15 to 20% of these babies are discharged to foster care, um, I don't know if you all realize that Texas is number two state in the U.S. for removals from parents. I'm talking about not just babies, I'm talking about even you know, older children who are being removed by, from parents. Texas is number two in the U.S. So we still have a lot of work to do for that. Um, and the cost of foster care is about $24,000 for the first year. So that also is not a cheap option. So that's something to keep in mind. Lastly, going on to a few, a few points that I just wanted to hit on before I sit down. In dealing with patient pop this patient population, I think the biggest barrier we as healthcare pro uh, providers face is our own biases. Not many of us get, I can tell you from my medical school training, I had zero training in terms of substance use disorders and how to deal with them. You need a special mindset. You've got to put away a lot of biases on your heart to be able to deal with this patient population. Definitely, if you can win the trust of these parents, they are very involved in the care of the baby. 
the moment you look at them or roll your eyes at them or use one of those word, stigmatizing words like drug mom, cocaine baby, or any of those kind of stuff, you, they're gone. They don't want to be judged any more than what they already judge themselves. So it's important that we have compassionate, non-judgmental, trauma-informed care in dealing with this patient population, inviting them and empowering them to be in the NICU. And when we have the pregnancy and postpartum period, probably for about six months, you have all those nice hormones flowing inside you, they're much more motivated to stay clean. None of these mothers chose to be an addict, right? It's one of those careers of narrowing options. They made their first choice and just a slippery slope they went down. So realizing that these moms are not there to harm these babies and for us to safely enable them and empower them to take care of their own babies will go a long way in keeping the baby and mom together. Um, so we need to see that as a unique window that we have when they come to the hospital because that mothering instinct is there and we need to empower them. Uh, we also need to have standardized policies and one of the many collaborators have looked at even between providers there are different standards they use to wean medication, to start medication, when to stand home. So that itself can make such a big difference in the length of stay, whether it's gonna be 21 days or 30 days. So several collaborators have looked at standardizing policies, when to start medication, when, when to wean, and when to discharge home. So that's important to have standardized policies, not just in the NICU, but also in L&D. And uh, one of the difficulties we have in Texas that I think the different pieces not talking to each other is the CPS system, the court system, has to be integrated with the hospital. So you want a safe discharge, and for that you need the CPS and the court systems involved. And lastly, a multidisciplinary team approach is needed, and it's very important that we don't work in silos to get the best outcome for the mom and the baby. I'll stop my talk there and we will open up to questions. Thank you so much to all of our presenters, and we do have um, some time for questions. Um, as anyone may be making their way up to a microphone, I think um, something, Dr. Isaac, that you touched on right at the end that I'd like to open as a question or pose as a question to everyone is, is as you mentioned, we didn't really have training on substance use as OB-GYNs or as um, neo um, nurses and physicians. And as we begin to roll out this opioid bundle, I think one of the challenges is going to be, you know, a, a lack of knowledge on some of these things. So if you all could maybe speak to some of the challenges and barriers you think we may face rolling this out and what kinds of things and resources we could use to overcome them. Would you like to begin, Dr. Fitzwater? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, these mics work, so. Oh, okay. We'll just make that. I think key challenges, um, overcoming stigma, uh, the very first thing. Uh, any of you who are providers in hospital settings uh, or have been for very long, I'm sure, have heard the language that we use uh, to describe these patients, as Dr. Isaac pointed out. Um, and we really, uh, as the number one thing, in my opinion, need to be working on uh, decreasing stigma. Uh, and that is going to have to start with um, education of these providers, which is a key component, by the way, of the, of the uh, opioid aim bundle uh, is to educate providers about these types of patients and uh, what, the, what their needs are. And I think as people become more familiar um, with the disease of substance use disorder uh, that they'll uh, be able to see that it's much more complicated than just making a choice to pick up a drug. As Dr. Isaac said, you know, these, these people didn't go into it choosing to be uh, addicted. Uh, they got there. They got there from a variety of life circumstances, uh, and um, they, uh, their situations are often extremely complicated um, and need to be uh, addressed in a, a very compassionate way. So changing language. Uh, and then also um, working uh, with CPS uh, in that system to, uh, to really help educate the folks that are in a position to make a difference in, in continuity uh, of family for these children. Unfortunately, because of the increase in NAS fivefold since 2000, um, I think there's a lot more attention 
on this. Uh, and um, societies like the NAN Association as well as the Vermont Oxford Network has got actually got modules that uh, we can log in and uh, um, you walk with some of these moms. A lot of them have put their own stories. And so when you read that, you realize that, man, this is, it, it could happen to anyone. It could happen to my sister. In fact, they say one in three Texans knows somebody who's addicted to painkillers. So if it's, it's no longer on the other side of the tracks, it might be across the road or your neighbor who's struggling with this. So because of the attention focused on this, I think in the last five years, a lot more resources, a lot more education has come out. All right, we have some questions on the floor. All right, um, I just wanted to make a small comment. Um, when I do hear the nurses talk at the desk and I do hear them say things like, uh, this mom is drug seeking. Uh, and when I, when I teach the nurses uh, on the unit about, um, about drug addiction, um, I do want to make it a point to make them understand that they're not drug seeking to get a high. They're drug seeking just so they can feel normal again. The high is not even there anymore for them. Um, when they go through withdrawal, they need the drugs just so they can feel normal. And just like we do that with insulin, you know, when moms eat, eat their high carb diets, we, we don't judge and we don't say, I'm not going to, I'm only going to give you half your sliding scale of insulin. We give them the full dose of insulin. We do need to make it a point that when, when there is an order for a patient to receive their pain medication, that we're not going to say, well, I'm not going to give it because she's just drug seeking. We need to give it just so this patient can start feeling normal again, and people forget that. Thank you. Hello again. Great presentation. Um, I wanted to um, ask um, the neonatologist in San Antonio. Um, I worked as a medical director at Community First Health Plan. I'm sure you know the health plan in San Antonio a couple of years ago. And at that time, um, it was we were becoming aware that the um, um, the, um, the incidence of, of, of drug addiction was going up. But also, um, San Antonio has the um, honor of having the highest teen pregnancy rate. And so I, I left before I could figure out if there was a relationship between the, t the high pre teen pregnancy rate and the um, and the um, the, the uh, opioid crisis. Do you know that? If, yeah. if there's a relationship. I think the Healthy Futures is take, tackling the, the high teen pregnancy rate, right? Uh -huh. yes. And you, you're asking what's the, com uh, is that accounting for the 30%? Right. Yes. And nobody's really, nobody's actually really sure. We have a very young population, as she, as she said, the teen rate is very high, but there are speculations that since we're so close to the Mexican border and the I-35 runs through San Antonio, that might be, that may be a part of why San Antonio is higher also. Okay. But once that wall comes up, I think you'll be fine. Well, okay. That's my political statement. <laughs> All right. Okay. And that's his political statement of the day. Okay. All right. Okay. The, the second comment I have is that um, just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Um, I have had uh, some, uh, what I consider some very tragic experiences with um, taking care as a neonatologist of uh, babies of uh, moms that were addicted. The first one I was practicing in, in Bryan College Station, and this mother had a set of twins. And, and um, she was very much out of control. I mean, she had all the stigma of, uh, of someone who um, had an addictive personality and had addictive traits. Um, but she, and she had these twins that were um, preterm, and they were, um, they were, you know, they had all the, the symptoms. And the other part of that shrill cry is that, they, that those kids are at high risk of being abused. And so um, reluctantly, I sent the baby home with a lot of consultation with uh, social services and CPS. Um, I sent the baby home with that mom. And within two months, they had both died of shaken baby syndrome. Um, the second case, if that's not enough. If the second case was a case that I reviewed uh, when I was a medical director at uh, Johns Hopkins in Maryland, when I, I first moved there, and uh, there was a baby that was in the hospital for six weeks, um, had severe withdrawal syndrome. And you're right, the, the average length of stay and, and, and that cost is about the same, but this baby had a prolonged course. And when it did finally go home, um, within two weeks, the mom for whatever reason that was related to her drug use was incarcerated, and the baby was left with the uh, father, 
and came back uh, two weeks later um, uh, with that thumb of distension and, and shock and had been uh, abused also, had a perforation, perforated uh, intestine and almost died. And I mean, you know, that case just brought tears to my eyes. That, that kid just, you know, just had a, had a bad turn. I mean, six weeks in the hospital for withdrawal, go home for two weeks, come back almost dead. So um, the, I think the lesson is that, yes, you know, I mean, these, the, 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 social com the social situation is very complex, it's very complicated, and, and, um, but by the grace of God go we, we should not be judgmental, but it is, it is a bad situation, and we do need to pay more attention to um, the social construct of, uh, and the home situation that those babies go home to, because it may, it, it, you know, that may be just the beginning of their problem. Just a follow-up comment on that. We do, we are in a broken society, and one of the things that I've seen in my last 10 years of being at Baptist Medical Center is in the olden days, we could find a safety plan, mom's brother, mom's sister, someone who knows mom quite easily, right? Now, 10 years later, what I'm seeing is, I mean, on my first meeting itself, I say, make a list of down to 10, because CPS is gonna go check out the first person, doesn't qualify, number two, doesn't qualify, number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, so it's many times you see this grandparents, no longer the same siblings, but grandparents who already has five or six of these mom's previous kids and her sister's kids. And when you go and see them and, and we say, you're not capable of taking care of this seventh kid. I mean, they're older, they're struggling, they raised their kids and they're retired. And so what I'm sensing is there's less and less people to step in from a family standpoint. Thank God for the foster system, but those are the where I think more support needs to be given. Because as, t I mean, it's very tragic when you take care of a baby for the first four weeks of the baby's life, within 48 hours of going home, you see the baby's picture. And it's traumatic for the nurses, traumatic for all of us, because we are become the parents of that baby. And despite all that we say, CPS still cleared the parents and the baby passed away. But thank God for CPS, I wouldn't want to be in their shoes. I mean, they're making life and death decisions as to babies going home with the parents or not. It's a tough job with a high turnover rate. Yeah. But I don't know if there's a perfect answer. You want to keep the families unified at the same time, you don't want bad outcome. Hi, um, thank you for your presentation. My name's Melinda, I'm an OB here in Austin. Just had two questions for you. What your opinion is about the best way to go about screening for substance abuse um, disorders in our pregnant population? and how forthcoming you feel patients will be about filling out those screening tools? And then um, how do you feel about routinely doing UDSs on high-risk population? So, so um, ACOG, I, I believe, recommends that you not use your drug screens, uh, number one, without the m mom's consent. Um, it's better to have the conversation. You're gonna get better information uh, by screening than you are by using drug screens. And the other thing is that I will say about drug screens is, you know, if you're gonna screen, you, ne you need to understand what those screens can and cannot tell you. So there's a very high false positive rate with uh, the typical urine screens that are given in the ER, the OBED, uh, very high false positive rate uh, for some substances and you can end up putting a woman who hasn't used anything into uh, through through a lot uh, where um, it's not really justifiable um, there are um, well I'm gonna stop there and let you comment Dr. Burton, about um, the screening tools yeah there's probably screening tools out there Do are we using one at the pavilion? I'm, I'm not, not that I'm aware okay. of. Okay. Um, I ask, and, and I think the, the secret is, I ask about substance abuse the same way I ask about trauma, assaults, domestic violence, in a non-judgmental um, way. I find that pregnancy is a unique opportunity for most women um, to get help because most women no matter the circumstances, and, and we see all sorts of psychosocial sort of uh, challenges in our clinic. Most women are open to attempting to change for their child's sake. 
And if you approach that woman with, I want to know because I want to provide help, not I want to know because I'm gonna report you or I'm going to shame you. Um, you know, we, we detox women off benzodiazepines all the time, um, very, very slowly, but with a lot of compassion. And so, again, I think it's with anything that's shaming, um, it's the way you approach it. I think the urine drug screen, you know, we've also had the, the situation where the urine drug screen's done, the psychiatrist is called, you know, the woman feels threatened, she doesn't, she says, you know, she was in her boyfriend's car or, you know, whatever. Um, and there are lots of false positives. Um, but then CPS gets involved and, and you create this sort of trauma for this woman. So again, I think looking at pregnancy is a unique opportunity to get women to quit smoking, to get women to change their diet, to get women off benzodiazepines, to get people off opiates, because you want to help them and, and you want to help their child. And so I don't know that screening is all that effective for substance abuse, because again, it's, um, I think women are afraid of getting in trouble and then it's gonna be, you know, a problem. Just the other side of that is, as the neonatologist, when a baby showing signs of withdrawal on day three, you wonder if the baby was exposed to anything. So that's a tough call on the neonatal side. Um, but many places are using the cord toxicology. So if they cut a piece of the cord, umbilical cord, and they can keep it for seven days. So if a baby starts withdrawing on third or fourth day, you have the cord to fall back on. So that actually is getting more and more popular. In those, that way you don't need the mom's urine. And you may have missed the baby's first void, but you got the cord. Do we have time for one more? I was just gonna make a quick comment about screening for the question that was asked. In our clinic, um, we do use a screening tool. It's a set of questionnaires that the patients answer. I don't know if it has a specific name. I'm sure it does, but I don't know what it is. But one of the things that I found really helpful in it, because it is hard to ask the patient questions about their own substance use, especially the way I was trained as a medical student, is you, do you drink, do you do recreational drugs, and do you smoke? Well, recreational drugs, <laughs> is kind of a weird category. It doesn't really ask, are you abusing your prescription medication? Are you abusing anybody else's prescription medication? That sort of thing. So it kind of misses a whole population. The screening that we use, um, the questionnaire asks, do you feel like you have a problem? Is there anyone else in your household that you feel has a, had a problem? And I have to say that that has been one of the questions that I've gotten the most bang for the buck out of. Um, because I have had patients disclose to me, you know what, I don't have a problem, but my husband really does. And so then that can lead you down to another conversation about domestic abuse or concerns for child welfare and things like that. And I think it also is not so targeted towards the patient that maybe they feel a little bit more open is that you really are asking about the welfare of the entire family system. But just a comment. I did want to just add just real quickly about the question about screening tools. If you go to the AIM website and look at the opioid bundle under the resources, there's a screening section. There's a, n a number of possible tools you can use there uh, that have been looked at. And, and again, I'm not sure how reliable one tool is versus another. I think the important thing, engage the patient in the conversation, establish a relationship. Uh, and, and you'll find out a lot. Thank you. Okay, so um, our next session is a concurrent breakout session. Um, and we're going to go ahead and start it at uh, 225 to give folks a 15 minute break and um, time to walk to their um, the rooms the obstetrics is going to stay here uh, neonatal is going to uh, room 103 and community health is going to room 104 and then after you are done with those sessions we're going to need to stop them at the same time that they're currently stopping which is 330 so they're going to be just a little bit reduced um, please come over here back at 345 and we're going to close out and get everybody back home in time. Thanks. <laughs>